Are you aware? You aware? Do you see things inside, visions and all the things you don't even know but can say aloud with an audience of one? And then welcome. This is Aware Talk Radio. Seven nights a week, hosting from the shores of Seattle and down in Reno's desert, out in Montreal, Canada, and Taos, New Mexico to Texas, and of course that big apple in New York. We welcome you London, Beijing, and Jaipur, down under in Oz in New Zealand. Thank you for listening. Back across the island, Indonesia and Hawaii, we welcome you all. This is Aware Talk Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my profound pleasure to introduce you to Hajar Gibran. Hajar, are you with us, sir? I'm right here, Chad. Thank you for being with us. And I know that uh, as we were speaking before about generally opening our show with a poem, I could think of no better introduction than for you to offer something of uh, something that you consider fitting. Yes, well, I'm I'm going to read the promise. This is an excerpt from the very last chapter of the prophet, where Khalil is promising that he will be back, which mm. I thought would be perfectly appropriate to introduce the return of the prophet. I agree. So the floor is yours, ladies and gentlemen. Hajar Gibran. Mm. Hello, everyone. This is uh, an excerpt from Khalil Gibran's. Prophet, the final chapter. Should my voice fade in your ears and my love vanish in your memory, then I will come again. And with a richer heart and lips more yielding to the Spirit will I speak. Yea, I shall return with the tide. If aught I have said is truth, that truth shall reveal itself in a clearer voice and in words more kin to your thoughts. And if this day is not a fulfillment of your needs and my love, then let it be a promise till another day. Know, therefore, that from the greater silence I shall return. A little while, a moment's rest upon the wind, and another woman shall bear me. Thank you so much. Stephen, welcome to the show as well. I know you're on with us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, also my honor to be uh, here with uh, Ajar Gibran. I have to say that uh, one of my favorite books is uh, Khalil's, and that's uh, The Prophet. Uh, I think it's one of the most well-known, if you could even bother to diminish such wisdom in that kind of a fashion. So uh, I might say it's a, it's a true pleasure. And I think it's interesting, if I might, uh, that uh, when he talked about his return, uh, little did we know of how those kinds of returns take place. Did it surprise you? Are you talking to me? Yeah. Yes, I am. Right. Okay. Sorry. Did, Sorry. It, did it surprise me that yeah. uh, I found this voice speaking to me? Yes, yes it did surprise me. I mean, I, I, I'm the last person that I would have expected this to come to, except for the fact that I am a descendant of the Gibran family. Mm-hmm. But I was a very lost soul and um, someone who uh, I wouldn't expect this voice to speak to, except for the fact that I I needed this voice, I needed this wisdom. So I think perhaps that might explain a little bit. But, um, yeah, it's a great mystery to me. Um, when, a, when a person is chosen, much like your uh, uncle, um, we... 
uh, I think most of us end up in a state of awe um, because of the way we view self-worth. But even if you look at your life and how it transpired, I would say without hesitation, it could have been no other than um, Hajar. Because wisdom is infinite. And being a stereo is a wonderful thing uh, because we're not the music and, and we know that. But yet in a roundabout way, you indeed are the stereo and you are the music. And well, and there's some music coming through. That's for sure. I mean, I, I, I uh, you know, I feel I'm, I'm no more than the vehicle, and I feel really blessed to be that. And it's the and beauty of that. It's, it's the beauty of that realization right there that awakens the true depth of that knowledge. So, mm-hmm. it's uh, absolutely my pleasure to be on here with you. So, no, well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I'd like to ask, Kajar, did you always hear this music? Did you did you always write, and did you always hear that voice? No, it's you know it's something that's developed over time. This has been a journey that I've been on for about forty years now. That began when my when I was fourteen years old, and my fifteen year old brother accidentally shot himself, and he was um, you know I didn't know myself separate from him, so it was a great loss for me. And I went into a very dark night of the soul that lasted for several years, and I was lost and tormented and unable to express the grief and torment that I felt within me until I finally had a catharsis that that was accompanied by this euphoric experience and this light in my consciousness and the room I was in filled with light, and that that experience transformed my life and it uh, initiated me on a spiritual quest that and had you been writing before that before that event no no i i really had no background in writing except for a little bit of journal writing and i'd written some little poems you know silly things and some songs but nothing that would have ever suggested that uh, I was going to somehow receive the transmission of the quality of the prophet. I mean, we're talking about one of the masterpieces of yeah. literature. And, um, you know, when I, when it first dawned on me that there was something coming through me, even then, you know, I, and somebody suggested that I should publish what was coming through, you know, the idea of the return of the prophet to me was something ridiculous that I would write anything of that caliber. So it's, um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's incredible. I understand that. I understand that even as a poet, I, I can't imagine sitting down to, to rewrite it myself or redoing Paradise mm-hmm. Lost or the next version. And I wanted to ask you that. How does it feel to sit down and write a book of poetry with this last name? <laughs> well, how does it feel... Uh, it's uh, at times it's earth shaking in a way. It, some of the some of the transmissions came through, and they touched me so deeply that I literally could hardly stand up. <laughs> My knees became so weak. The power of the words, and and also there, you know, it was also a, a dedication because what I received was like pieces of a puzzle. I had, you know, I was, I was bringing, I had certain meditation practices that I did and different writing practices that I was using to communicate with the prophet. And so I ended up with a large body of work that, in a way, uh, was unrelated or there wasn't a, a clear continuity. There wasn't a story there. They were just bits of wisdom. And then it was my job to put all these pieces together and to see the bigger picture, to tell the bigger story, which ended up being the story of my own awakening, the story of my life, which led up to my past life memory at the tomb of Khalil Gibran in the mountains of Lebanon. Wow. Yeah, so, so, yeah. But the beauty of it is, is your journey helped you tie it all together so that... Uh, uh, you could uh, present, uh, I mean, after all, Hazar, how does one present wisdom in the first place? 
How do you do that? <laughs> and, and then I think another thing is is we go through the old idea, and I like to I like to hear what Azar says. Uh, did you ever ask yourself once it dawned on you why me? Hmm. Mm. Yes, I've, I've certainly asked that. And like I said earlier, I, I really felt like, uh, uh, you know, that it would be anyone other than someone like me for this, you know, to bring this through because I wasn't someone who natu- naturally had virtuous qualities or was some, you know, was trained as a as a writer. I mean, Khalil spent his life dedicated to his art, to his writing, and to his painting. I mean, he developed that. I didn't have that background at all. It just came through. And that, so, uh, you know, so it it amazes me that somehow this is happening, and it it is of the quality of the prophet. And I get that uh, acknowledgement over and over again. Just the fact that it's been embraced by now over a dozen international publishers it's going out to over 20 countries and all of this happened without me putting any effort into uh, trying to share it with the world i was teaching meditation on a beach in a little island in the south seas of thailand and i was you know through the meditations i was receiving the writing and i was recording it and putting it together as a book but i never did, I didn't do a single thing to try to send it out to the world. What happened was um, a literary agent from New York City, Greg Dinkin, walked up to me one day when I had finished the manuscript and just said, hey, I hear you're writing a book. <laughs> and I handed him the manuscript, and that was about a year ago, and now it's already out. You know, it's, The whole world is receiving it. So it's it really seems like it was meant to be a very Absolutely. process. As if you uh, ab- it yourself. Uh, absolutely, Hazar. I mean, when you have, when true wisdom comes to light, true wisdom can never be stopped because people mm-hmm. in this world today are hungry for the level of wisdom that you are bringing back. So the prophet has returned. Mm-hmm. And, it's yes, certainly, and it seems like a time when it's really needed. Absolutely. See, to to myself, the universe knows when it's time for wisdom to be shared. It knows when people will not only hear, but will honor the wisdom that is being shared. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's so wonderful that um, that a a member of the uh, uh, of your lineage happens to have been the one chosen to do it. And I, I would say your life had to be what it is, or this may not have been possible. But of course, that's ludicrous to say because here it is, and it, <laughs> yeah. it, it and it should be uh, almost a walk in the park. Uh, and I'm certain there's many more to come through you, uh, because of you, because of the way the world is today. So um, share it, sir. Just bring it well, forth. Well, thanks for the encouragement. And I, and I think about who Khalil was and about, you know, the times we're in, how he, he, uh, he's a, such a unique, uh, you know, the way he bridges the Arab world with the Western world. He was mm-hmm. born a Christian, though, in, in, in a primarily Muslim world. And um, his, his teachings have been embraced by all religions. Absolutely. The Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians all uh, hold the prophet very high. Yeah. And so I think it's, you know, it's, uh, if anyone can somehow bring about a sense of unification between these factions that are at war with each other, it's, you know, there's, he holds a real unique position. It, and it seems as if Khalil actually gave us a truth that supersedes dogmas and ideologies. And I can mm-hmm. say after reading The Return of the Prophet that the words you've given us here are in the same vein. After I read this, 
you don't have questions. You don't have a, yeah, well, what about this, or a, yeah, but. It's such a totality of truth on both sides, telling you the good and the bad, the yin and the yang, in such a beautiful way that at the end of it, all you can say is nothing. Silence oh. is the only reply. <laughs> wow. It's wonderful to hear you say that. I know the words I, were, have been so meaningful to me. Well, but those... Things, go ahead. I'm sorry, what's that, Stephen? No, I was, I was, I was just going to say that wisdom is uh, profound to any reader. And if, mm-hmm. if after one reads something, and as Chad's already said, uh, and you sit there in silence, which is in awe, we know that it's already echoing through the halls of the mind to awaken my child, to awaken. Um, and mm-hmm. when anyone can write like that, Hajar, um, when you can put a pen to paper and being just a part of that has got to be one extremely astounding experience. Yes, it sure is. It sure and is. It's, it's profound in a way that um, and it and actually affects your thoughts, which of course affect our behaviors. And one of the things from the book that's just kind of shaken my entire foundations is the idea that the crimes committed against you are, are crimes committed for you. And that's right. just profound in so many ways because I've always kind of felt, had the feeling inside that I was almost born to rage against the injustices I see. Uh, the way you put it in here, uh, it's almost, I don't know if it's better to intervene and try to assist in what I consider to be the solution or just better to accept the lesson for what it is and say thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a delicate balance to be able to learn the lessons and actually appreciate the experience, even though it's a painful experience, and yet to take a stand for the values that you want to manifest in your life and in the world. Would you say, Hajar, that the thing that actually creates the pain is how we judge the situation to be as opposed to the acceptance of the situation simply for what it is? Yeah, well, certainly the way we judge it, the way we look at it, is, you know, core in producing the quality of experience we have. I mean, we may be in a situation that is painful in in and of itself, mm-hmm. say the loss of a loved one or something, but it's how we, you know, it's our, our attitude towards that. If we... Um, you know, for instance, if we have the perspective that that uh, death is merely a transition between lifetimes, much like night is a transition between days, then and, the, and if we have the position that we can that when someone dies, they're, they haven't left our sphere of influence. We can still talk to them. We can still listen to them talking to us. The, you know, the ability to communicate actually can even be freer and more meaningful because now they're speaking to us from a different realm. You know, so it's, but if we, if we feel that death is a complete ending and it's a loss and there's nothing there that we, after death, then, you know, we can, we can really suffer deeply just because of our own thoughts and beliefs. And that's someone, you've spoken from a point of loss from someone who's experienced a great deal of it. Um, From the book, I mean, when you first started hearing these things that were coming through to you, uh, you said that you applied those in your life and they started producing great abundance. Um, Could you share a little bit about that with us? Share about how I ended up acquiring abundance in my life? Is that what you said? Yes. Well, uh... I think I understand your question. How I how I applied the what I was learning and how that transformed my life and how I, I grew into abundance. Yes. Well, I mean, at one it, let's see. You know, it's been a long journey and it developed over time. And I and I also went through numbers of trainings. I learned a lot about journeying in the inner world, shamanic practices and meditation practices and self hypnosis practices. I've 
I've done a lot of work with past life regression and soul retrieval and different types of uh, energetic healing. So, uh, and so combined with with my training and also the prophet guiding me at some point, um, you know, that became the central theme of my life. And I created a retreat center in Colorado dedicated to Khalil Gibran and in a really wonderful place called Dream Canyon. And um, that went on for a few years. And I thought I'd be there for the rest of my life because it was such an incredible piece of property and a labor of love. But I ended up getting allergies to the uh, grass pollens and the tree pollens there that were so severe that in the end my eyes started bleeding from it and I had to leave. And I tried everything to heal the allergies. but So I ended up selling the property and I made a lot of money on the sale of the property and I moved to Hawaii and started another retreat center there. And um, once again, my intentions to somehow put something in concrete form ended up uh, dissolving before my eyes. And the message I got, that what was Prophet was teaching me was not to be so, um, you know, not to want it to be manifested in form, but it was for me to somehow embody this spirit that was coming through me. Yes, and, and you had mentioned about that you, well, not after you had built that and things mm-hmm. were abundant, uh, the next chapter in the book was betrayal, and I think everyone relates to this. I just wonder if you might be able to share a little bit of the story about how these things occurred within your own life about betrayal and at the end of it, how you came to view it as a lesson. Yes. I mean, in the book, I really just get into it a little bit. I talk about a friend of mine who came in who was a, a multimillionaire. And and um, at, the, at the time, I had acquired quite a lot of money and, and my assets were growing and I felt uncomfortable managing it on my own. And he offered to help me manage my assets and set me up with a land trust so the property that I bought for the retreat center could be held as a, in a trust and not in my personal name. And, and he, had, he set up a whole plan for me and I trusted him to do that and he ended up just disappearing with everything. <laughs> so I lost the whole thing, but that was just a part of it. At the same time, the woman who I was in love with and had been with for five years and we owned uh, a home together in Hawaii. She, we we used it as a meditation center, and she started having an affair with another friend of mine, who was uh, part of the meditation group. So it was this betrayal by two friends and my lover. And at the same time, another friend of mine was dying of hepatitis C, and which and the doctors had sent him home because he was in the final stages of death. He had wasn't eating, he, he was on uh, morphine for the pain, he was also diabetic and he was on insulin, he was basically just, you know, uh, so they they gave him not much more than a week or two. He, his body was covered with open lesions, he'd lost his hair, he could barely lift his arm, let alone get out of bed. And I was there as part of a support group to just basically, um, you know, be with him during his final days. And so that, in a way, made all of my problems seem minor. But what happened completely blew my mind. We we um, heard about a Hawaiian shaman, or a shaman who uh, he actually wasn't Hawaiian by blood, but he was in Hawaii, who had cured someone else of hepatitis C. We, I mean, it's a long story, but this shaman, call him Shaman X because he doesn't want to be known, uh, came in and uh, he he said he talked to my friend and said I will come on one condition that you promise to die well you may only live one day or two days but I want you to promise that you will leave a legacy of courage to your family and friends on how well you die and wow. uh, my friend promised and he came in and I mean. Uh, he just he he knew that my friend had been in the Vietnam War and he came in as if he was a general in the army and he started yelling at everyone 
and to break up this sympathy group. The last thing this soldier needs is sympathy. And he yelled at my friend. He said, get your sorry ass out of bed. You've got to drag your, you know, you've had half your body blown off, and you've got to drag yourself through 10 miles of muddy trenches and get back to base camp. Otherwise, all your buddies are going to die with you now. Get up. And he, he told them to go out into his yard and gather some firewood and build a fire. And all he had to do was keep that fire going. He wanted him to keep it going from, for 30 days because it was full moon that day and to keep it from moon to moon, keep the, because that's 28 days, keep the fire going. And he said, when you're ready to die, you just let the fire go out. And he said, invite all your family and friends and ask them to come and bring firewood and then to put a piece of wood in the fire and to pray for you while the while their wood burns. And it turned into this fire ceremony that uh, that um, called the spirit back to my friend. He regained his spirit. By the end of the month, he was the shaman. And he had, com- he had thrown his morphine and his insulin into the fire. He was barely sleeping at night. He was so impassioned and so alive. And lots of other people came and were healed during the fire ceremony. I mean, it was miraculous what happened and and I was right there in the midst of it and had a very close relationship with the shaman that's a whole nother story so um, all of this happened simultaneously the loss of my assets the loss of my lover the loss of my home the betrayal of close friendships and the realization of the power of the, what in Hawaii they call it Ho'oponopono, the power of the healing dream. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and, and Hajar, in the middle of all of that, that is exactly what I wanted you to share with the audience. And in the middle of all that, the words that are coming through you are... <laughs> You're not absolved of the wrong that is done unto you. When at last you see clearly, you will realize that the crimes committed upon you are committed for you. Uh, That is a wisdom that even supersedes the tragedy and loss you are experiencing in the moment. That's strength. It's just yes. I mean, I see what what happened to me. I mean, from one from my personal egoic point of view, was tragic all this loss and betrayal. But the truth is that that, if it wasn't for that experience, I wouldn't be writing this book. If it wasn't, I mean, it's that, it's, you know, having to deal with that that made me dig really deep into my soul and find truth. I mean, one of the, especially around money, I lost almost a half a million dollars. And... And, uh, you know, I, my identity was somehow related to having that money. And when I asked myself what I lost, I couldn't really find anything that I'd lost except this idea that I had worth or I had money. And I really had to get to the truth of that. Like what, you know, where does worth come from? Is is it really money that makes it possible for me to manifest my dreams, to get what I want, to be who I want to be? Does money give me that? And I realized it wasn't money. That if I thought money gave that to me, then then I was attached to the money and I would feel insecure with having the money because I might lose it. And I realized it's only a spiritual power that gives me the ability to be who I want to be and to realize what I want to realize in my life. And that was, I think, one of the most empowering realizations. Yes, that is very empowering. Stephen, I know you've experienced things of similar nature. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, I I can't um, echo enough with um, we as individuals actually give our power away over the illusion of money when we look at the world today money is is given so much credence and importance that it's actually that money is more important than the individual and i think what hajar learned was an abject lesson and where the true power of being resides 
and mm. that's within your own self. And that's quite a startling wake-up, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, because on one level we get it's you know we get so seduced by the material world, thinking that that's real, and we can we can feel vulnerable in that reality. So, and, do you, I have a question playing on that. Um, would Would you say that you're today not as vulnerable as you were back in those days? Let's call it those days of. Uh, divine experience <laughs> uh, uh, no I, I've I've certainly grown immensely through these experiences and um, yeah I, I have very very little feelings of vulnerability in terms of you know, the material world what, one of the things I'd love to share with people as you are is the fact that it is our experiences which give us the greatest process of learning opportunity that we could ever even imagine. And it's so wonderful. True. And it's wonderful mm. to hear uh, a gentleman such as yourself that's had uh, the experiences you have and have turned them into a profound thing of magnificence. That's difficult mm. for the average human to do. Well, I mean, and that's what makes it valuable. It takes courage to follow your spiritual calling, to follow your highest truth, to live your life courageously. And, and unless you live your life courageously, you're destined to a lev- level of mediocrity. So it's, you know, it's kind of a paradox that you know, in order for life to be what you want it to be, you have to be the person you need to be, that, and that ultimately takes courage. It can't come from anywhere else but within yourself. And we're, we're cast into a world that does scare us, that does, in, in, uh, in the book, how is it? it says you're, you're born into a world that offers you less than it needs you to be. <laughs> wow. <laughs> First, you, wow. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, there you go. You know, but once you realize that's your, you know, that's the situation, that it's inevitable. That's what the human condition is. You know, it's like an actor on a stage. If it's going to be a good movie, there needs to be this built-in tension, this, you know, insurmountable obstacle. And then somehow the hero has to find the courage to, you know, to face the dragon or face whatever it is that the story's about. And that's the, you know, that's the, hero, the hero's journey, the human condition that we all are on some level cast into. The interesting thing is, is that I, 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 uh, when you were talking earlier about the shaman, I, I was also in Southeast Asia. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I, firmly of the mind that a hero never knows they're a hero. Uh, it's just the, the proper thing to do. Um, mm. and, when we, and when we look at our own selves, being the hero to ourselves, ultimately, and that's free of arrogance, they don't mm. realize, I mean, you never realized that that's what you were doing. I mean, facing mm. ourself is a, is a monumental task on one mm-hmm. hand, but on another it really isn't because the path of acceptance can alleviate that. If yeah. that makes sense. And, yes, for sure. And and there's also, you know, there's this there's this larger reality that is acting upon us. Mm-hmm. That you know, it's like we can inevitably we cannot escape our own journey. We can't escape. <laughs> <laughs> no, we try. We well, can hide I know. From it. <laughs> we can try to set ourselves up so that we're safe or whatever. But you look at what's happening on the, you know, the human drama, the story of what's going on in the world now, and it's going to take a lot of courage for people to somehow, you know, for humanity to somehow deal with what's unfolding with you know i mean it to me it's really i'm I'm really encouraged by what's happening because i think it's a really good sign 
that wonderful to hear that because I, I, I myself have been saying that for some time. Mm, yes. That, that yeah. now, that now is the time to wake up. Uh, said once quite a while ago that every every time our comprehension is defied, our compre- our comprehension has also grown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Every time, say that again. Uh, that every, every time our comprehension of things is defied, mm-hmm. like we, we, we see a size of a storm that's never been witnessed before, that defies our comprehension. Yes. When we look at the state of the world, it's actually defying our comprehension. Yet yes. each time our comprehension is defied, our comprehension has grown. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yes, it forces us to to somehow see beyond the box we've lived in. Yes, but see, that's the beauty of your timing, your book, and the return of the prophet. The comprehension has been defied so much that it's Mm -hmm. ready to hear and to be able to comprehend on deeper levels the Mm -hmm. very messages that you're bringing forth. And I think that's the beauty of the process that we're actually witnessing right now. I think so, too. And the book. The world um, world is ready for you. (laughs) <laughs> the book is available out, of course. Now we have that link to our page there on Blog Talk Radio. Uh, all the Aware Talk Radio listeners in the audience, we've got the, uh, the chat room open as well. We're posting links. There's going to be open up the phone lines as well for those who would like to interact with you, Hajar. Um, well, one of the things you had mentioned, uh, well, before we get to that, I guess, what's, where's the best place for people to contact you and um, even to pick up a copy of the book? Well, I know it's available on Amazon. And yeah. uh, and and it's you know it's going to be in bookstores all across the country too, and and it's being translated into already twelve different languages. So it's wow, it's out there. I mean, it hasn't been released in the foreign languages yet, uh, but it, it won't be long. Yeah, it's even coming out in Chinese and in Czechoslovakian, <laughs> Israel, Good. Italy, France, Spain. I mean, yeah, Denmark. Yeah, there's a whole list. It's it's amazing. Um, <laughs> well, and also, they can. can con- I have a website also that you can contact me. It's just Excellent. Hajar Gibran. It's just HajarGibran dot com. Excellent, and we do have that posted as well on this segment. And uh, so, for those listening, definitely check out those links as well. Uh, you know, Hajar, you'd mentioned in the book about even getting addicted to states of bliss. And your bliss in that situation was kind of like mine. You get attracted to where you want to sit in those silent spaces and listen to the nothing that gets whispered between our thoughts a lot more than you want to go outside and go shopping. And you said there's, you even got caught up in kind of being addicted to that, addicted to the revelations that you were getting. Could you kind of speak on that? Mm-hmm. I think you're talking about that part when I write about uh, uh, you know where I'm just questioning what you know it almost seemed like an obsession that I was having that I would spend so many hours in in my inner world communing with this inner voice and um, yes and you know and really wondering what you know, sort of being torn between being involved in some kind of obsession, but also being, you know, that there being something valid about this calling. Because this is before I really realized that I was going to be writing a book or that I had some kind of special connection to Khalil Gibran. I hadn't gone back to Lebanon yet, and I, it was that. And in that, in that questioning, it, I it. It really led me to wanting to get to the bottom of it. And what is this about? Because I've mm-hmm. been trained to communicate with spirit guides. That was something, you know, I to me wasn't mystical at all. It's something anyone can learn to do. And it didn't surprise me that Khalil Gibran would be my spirit guide because, you know, I'm a, I'm a Gibran. <laughs> and I didn't I didn't think of it as something that had any kind of uh, connotations about me being a vehicle for the prophet or for Khalil. I thought it was just my own personal 
my own personal guide for myself. But uh, to, you know, but it became it became such an obsession for me that I wanted to go deeper into it, and so I I journeyed back to Lebanon, uh, up to where Khalil is buried in this old monastery in this little village called Bishari up in the mountains, which is where he spent his childhood. And while I was there, it was incredibly emotionally moving and mystical experience where, and the dialogue in my head was so interesting because Khalil, it was as if Khalil was inside of me and he was the one that was experiencing these emotions. And I was in a way being his comforter and talking to him. And um, it was really interesting. And then, you know, and I, I, so there was a part of me that resonated so much with this village that I knew in some way that I belonged there, that I had come from there. But it was just sort of subtle uh, impressions. I didn't, you know, the, it was so unfamiliar to me who I am in this life. But then when I was in the cathedral, I had a vision of a favorite place, and I write about this in the book, a yeah. favorite place yeah. that I had been, that I used to go as a child up in the mountains. And I was able to just follow my instincts and find that place. And and that's what really, uh, you know, something about that being in Bashari, that pilgrimage I took, that somehow going to my roots, having this real mystical past life memory, just it just opened me, and that's when the book started coming through. That's when, um, you know, until then, there it was just sort of dribbles of writing that I was doing, and nothing of and, much significance. And as are, if I might, I think standing before the waterfall in the vision, seeing him touch your forehead, and in that crystal moment of seeing it all, is that when it just kind of clicked, like, huh, here's what I'm here to do? This is why I'm here? Well, you know, I, I mean, that's in a way the way I write it in the book. Is that, you know, the book is, you know, it's a poetic parable, so it isn't it isn't sure. exactly true, you know, the way things unfolded. Because what happened was I had this incredible mystical experience up here in Lebanon, in the mountains that lasted just for three days. And then uh, I went to Thailand. A friend had invited me to go on a two-week meditation retreat there with her, and so I went. And while I was there, uh, I made friends with the meditation teacher, and it turned out he was getting ready to leave, and he asked me if I would take over teaching meditation. And I needed to meditate, and so I said yes, and I ended up sitting there for three and a half years teaching meditation, sometimes seven days a week. And it was through, it was coming from that mystical experience to going deep into meditation that was really what gave me the time, the space, the frame of mind to be open to the writing. And that's when the writing came through. And I was also, I was um, teaching some writing exercises, meditative writing exercises that, that I ended up practicing. And so that, that's how the book happened. So you kind and, of ended and, up you kind of ended up being your own teacher. Yeah. Mm hmm. Life <laughs> life just you know, somehow unfolded in just the right way to let this happen. I could have never mm -hmm. designed it this way. So so in essence it's like your 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 whole life, no matter what the experience was, turned into the idea of mysticism. So basically it ended up with all the dots being connected and then the knowledge and wisdom started flowing back through you because of all of the previous experiences. Yes, exactly. Like I would be put in a situation where I needed to do what I ended up doing and it was through doing that that somehow it was the next step on this journey that of wow. bringing through the prophet. So it wasn't, you know, I, if I, I, mean, I couldn't it, have intended it. If, uh, forgive me, but I'm a little excited here because there's something out there that I'd like all of the listeners to come to realize. There was a point in your life 
where you were living through the eyes of regret. And then mm -hmm. it, it, it moved itself over into the path of acceptance and then moved itself into the path of your own true divine nature. And so today I would surmise that uh, Hajar has no regrets of anything in his life. <laughs> That's true. Yes, okay. I know it was Thank interesting because when they, when, you know, when the publishers wrote my book, and there's a little thing on the, the jacket cover, and it says something like Hajar, this is the visions Hajar experienced during his troubled past. And I said, how can you write that? My past was <laughs> troubled. I had the most blessed past. <laughs> you know, so I, but they wouldn't take it off. They, the publishers said they're the ones who write. The jacket cover, it's their words. And they saw it as really? a troubled past. <laughs> yeah, but but that, that's, a that's a beautiful way to see it, because I share with people all the time, Ajar, that idea that your past, actually, our pasts actually build us into who we become. But we yes. get too caught up in staring backwards at the past that mm -hmm. publishers see it as a troubled thing when what it was was a learning experience to ensure, and I'm going to use that word, to ensure you bringing the profit back. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, in that regard, I guess we're all prophets and every life being lived is a self-fulfilled prophecy. There you go. Yes, it's true. I mean, that's, you know, that is the human journey is to, somehow resolve our own internal conflict by tapping into our higher qualities of compassion and wisdom, courage. And it's, uh, you know, it's the same for all of us. It comes through in unique ways. But we all are in that same situation. Perfectly you know, stated, sir. Perfectly. I want to know what's next. Surely you realize you've just opened... A Pandora's box of infinite treasures that you seem to be quite well, yeah, quite simply able to capture on the page. So, what are you writing next? Well, I, you know, I am writing, and uh, I, I guess I'm. I never know what it's going to be. Like I didn't know this was going to be the return of the prophet. Um, but you know, I, I kind of ask myself, well, since here I am, sort of playing into this role of bringing through the voice of the prophet, what would the prophet do if he did come back? And, you know, and to me, he's the one who would bring a vision to humanity and an invitation for people to participate in this vision in a way that created a collective global movement, uprising of, uh, of love to bring about a, a, a manifest a manifestation of a higher nature in human society, and so I'm writing something I'm calling the Great Awakening, which um, wow. you know my attempt to sort of live into that vision. And I, the way I see it is not that I'm going to offer the vision, because the vision has to come from everyone. It has to be a collective vision. Yeah. In a way, it requires all of us to be visionaries. It requires there to be somehow an awakening of a conscious visionary community that is connected to each other and working together collectively. That you know, takes that kind of um, that kind of cooperation and leadership of a number of people. And that's happening already, I think. Absolutely, and it's because of people like uh, Hajar or even Chad and even myself. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the book I just started, the, the title is Divine Mind, Sacred Thought. Oh, beautiful. Uh, so it's kind of in, in, in tune with what you're saying there in the idea of awakening because as you mm -hmm. now realize, you have that. And I, I'm certain you would, you would be in alignment with the idea that we're all just alike in that same equation. We have that mm -hmm. part. Yes. Yes. That's that's the part that uh, books like you've uh, like you've just put out uh, that is having people rise, even in what we could term as illusional turmoil in societies. Um, mm -hmm. It's still that awakening. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. 
I want to know, you said the Global Uprising for Love. Where can I sign up for that, Hajar? <laughs> <laughs> you already did. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you remember the day you were born? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want email updates on every meeting for that, because uh, that's an organization I would definitely like to be part of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, it thrills me to hear you say that, Chad, because, uh, you know, that that's what I really want to see happen. I'd like to see that come through me as my next project is is to be able to say, yeah, I see it as as a, starting out as sort of an interactive game between people. Mm. You know, like in a way, I you know, to me, that's what's happening on the world stage is we're playing a game always. And like now, the game is monopoly. Uh-huh. We all we all were, you know, educated in the game of monopoly. So now it's nations playing monopoly and political yeah. leaders playing monopoly. And we need to play the game of love. Mm. Sounds like uh, a more fun game to me. <laughs> yes. Mm. So, I, I, I'm with I, I'm with Chad. Uh, show me the dotted line. <laughs> I'll sign it. <laughs> Not only that, but interesting in the wording there, monopoly, mono, just one, you know, oh, whereas yeah. the game we're looking to play is uh, is a collective, is everyone playing as a visionary. And, uh, contr- and we, really, it comes down to this, what we think happens. And so once people mm-hmm. become aware of that, if you could get a mass of the critical mass of people aware of the fact that their thoughts are actually creating reality, we could up and change the world in one day just by changing our minds. Yes. Hey, I, 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 I happen to know a two CD set that talks about that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I got the idea, Stephen. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? Oh, I have a two CD set out there called The Power of Thought. Oh. Uh, and it uh, it actually it talks about that, uh, but you know anything that myself and I'm sure Chad uh, would be in alignment with is anything that we can do to assist you and your message. You've got my shoulder, sir. Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. well, thank you so much, brothers. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Again, we well, do have I mean, all I, the links posted. I'm sorry, what's that, Herjo? Well, I was just going to say, you know, there's some things happening now that I think are really exciting. And one is this open source phenomena where mm-hmm. people all over the world are collaborating in creative ways. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, uh, you know, it's like a true sort of democracy mm-hmm. where there's really no leadership. But it's, it's a, it, things get created just through pure gifting and cooperation. And I think there's a potential for a human community to somehow emerge through this open source phenomenon where people are, uh, you know, and then there's also the, the local currencies that's being developed that where people are learning how, you know, are practicing exchanging their goods and services and resources without participating in the global monetary system. And so I, it's you know I, I'm seeing the formation of a human community that is independent of these obsolete systems that in a way are hindering us. And are they I, hindering I'm, or really, teaching I'm really excited about it. Are, are they hindering us or teaching us? Well, yes, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're both, right? They're yeah. forcing us to find a better way. Exactly. Yeah. They're, they're, they're better they're making way us suffer. Exist. Yes, they're, they are hindering us in that they're, you know, they're dysfunctional in on on the practical level, but mm-hmm. on the fact that they, you know, they are set up for us to have to find a better way. Then, on that from that point of view, they're you know, they're coming from a higher source, of course. Absolutely. How could it be any other way? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but if there's absolutely anything uh, um, that uh, either of us, and, uh, and forgive me, Chad, because I am speaking for you, that we can do Please to do. assist you in, uh, in the endeavor that you're after, I mean, the world needs, uh, well, I shouldn't say need, uh, 
because the awakening is coming and the unification is coming. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, that's that's a, you know that's that paradox again that it's a natural unfolding. It's really not our it's not our job to make it happen. What I see is that it's it's our opportunity to be, be part of it. You know, that, you know, it's in other words, the world's whatever we see it to be. We could see that the world is somehow spiraling down into a dark abyss, and then that's how we would experience the world. Or we can see that it's something that is, you know, that there's a great awakening happening and people are waking up to these higher realms and transcending into states of bliss and joy and celebration with each other. And that's happening. And we have the opportunity to be part of that. And that, to me, is what's exciting. It's not that there's a problem in the world and it's our responsibility to fix it. No, mm. there's an opportunity to to live our life in a way that we become part of what's possible within the human soul. Stated. That's absolutely beautifully stated, sir. No question. Well, From the mouth of a poet to uh, your ears. So <laughs> our, it's definitely been... Our pleasure to have you on, and of course we would uh, we would be honored to have you on at any time. I'd like to even hear just the surprise call every now and again on our poetry nights, where you can call in and just do something free to recite. Uh, that that should always be interesting. Yeah. Well, I I'm I'm honored by the invitation and to be speaking to you today. I have to find out a little bit more about. I don't even know where you are. <laughs> and they, they told me very little. They just said. Come and sit in this office. Somebody's going to interview you on the radio, and their name is Chad. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, and uh, I'm I'm actually flying back to Thailand tomorrow night. Uh, but I I would love to keep in touch with you. I I feel such a wonderful connection to both of you. Thank you. And, Thank you. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. Uh, as, as suggested, uh, you certainly have my shoulder. So if you need another one to help. Uh, um, Hmm. accomplish the mission is what I'll put uh, in the awakening of all of human. Uh, boy, what an honor for me. I cherish that in a second. <laughs> oh, thank you. And I'd like to thank you again for being here. We are down to the last three minutes of the show. Stephen, I'd like to give both of you a chance just to quick closing thoughts, things to leave with the listeners. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> life, life is given to us as a gift. We never realize the gift until we've truly experienced ourselves for who we are in the infinite state that we can easily become. Once we have that experience, it's easy to understand the life and the, para- and the, the illusional paradoxes that drift before our eyes when we use the higher divine essence of our true nature is when we step in the envelope of love to be then shared with all of humanity. Mm. You share what could you leave us with this evening or this afternoon? Well, you, the the message that I think is really pertinent that is this is this realization that that we are eternal beings that death isn't an ending, it's simply a transition. And that knowing that we have the opportunity to really live our life courageously because there's nothing to lose here. There's only something to gain and what we can gain is experience. That's really the only thing we can gain that's lasting. And in order to gain that, we have to be courageous. And also I about the sacred nature of of life too and you know what what i really want to do is just read the last little bit in the book the last few lines because to me there do i have time to do that it's just a couple minutes not even that absolutely okay this was um what did i say okay forget not that you dwell within me always a boundless drop in a boundless sea There is no end to my source and no limit to my grace. When you drift into sleep, I hold you in silent serenity. 
And when you awaken, it is within my presence that you dwell. I live in your heart, and you live in mine. You are my dream, and I am your awakening. Through you, I am dressed in beauty. Through me, you are beyond what can be. No perfect, more perfect ending than that. I thank you so much, Hajar, for being on. Stephen, as always, it's great to speak with you. I look forward to doing this again. Mm, I look forward to it, too. Thank you so much, Chad, and such a pleasure to meet you in this uh, virtual reality. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. And, of course, you know, we generally do go out with a song, but I'll be honest, ladies and gentlemen, our switchboard is completely gone. They have nothing there. So I was going to leave something that I wrote a long time ago. I actually wrote it for Khalil, um, but I'd like to dedicate it to Ajar. And this is Khalil Gibran, poet of Lebanon, whose name is synonymous with prophet, whose words are rivers of, flowing, of water flowing as mighty as the spring Euphrates. Khalil, for you I lay down my pen. For you I yield my thoughts to a silence as calm and still as the holy cedars, reverently standing tall above autumn's golden sunlit ground. I bathe my being in the wisdom so granted you. I'm awed by your attention to matters that only a master could begin to address, let alone express in a language as eloquent as poetry. Your words become myrtle mixed with wine, inebriating my soul with substance, as intoxicating of love as love first felt. In the use of spring, your lines as shapely and beautiful as lilies adorned in natural majesty, as pure in their creation as woman is to man, and man is to God. Khalil Gibran, whose words are like swords to the ears of oppression, whose eyes are filled with heaven's tears falling upon the earth's inhabitants, whose descending like water down a mountain, and angels whisper, sacred and sacrificed as life and as wolves to the prey upon the shepherd's flock, who was banished and labeled a heretic by Shikab Alibas, Khalil Gibran, who accepted his calling, his companion with Christ in that same body, one mind attuned to the nature of God. To you, Khalil Gibran, I sing this song of admiration. Standing beneath heaven with arms uplifted and spirit sealed with humble adoration for your ability to say what the voice speaks to the heart in those still and silent times of wakefulness. The beauty of your sight is as perplexing and gentle as the ways of nature herself. In your woven lines of inspiration, I find myself lost and wandering in understanding greater than ever before. And by your senses aware and withdrawn as the horizon, as lucid as they are near, I am drawn like a moth to the brilliance of your flame. And I thank you for being here, all of you. This has been a Word Talk Radio. I'm Chad Ling. Chad, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs>